When the Germans invaded France in June of 1940, France's military was quick to fall before the might of the Nazis. During the occupation, the streets of France became the battlefield, and the citizens of France became the soldiers. These citizens were the silent heroes of World War II. underground movement that emerged in France in 1940 after the, after the fall of France in June of 1940. And from 1940 until 1943, the, the underground in France was relatively small. There was such frustration and horror in France in June of 1940 after the armistice with the Nazis. And many French people just could not believe that France had not fought longer and harder, and there was so much opposition to Nazism and the threat that it posed to France and to Europe and to much of the world. There was a this transnational movement of uh, uh, individuals who were interested in, in uh, fighting the Nazi and, and fascist regimes. The French government may have surrendered to the Nazis, but they did not surrender the spirit of the French people. After an enormous victory during World War I, many citizens of France felt that their government had been cowardly by surrendering, even while many, if not most of its citizens, wanted to continue the fight. This is how the resistance began. Almost every person living in France during the occupation participated in the resistance in one way or another. It could have been as simple as reading an illegal newspaper, or listening to a banned radio broadcast. It also could have been as active as evacuating downed airmen, participating in acts of sabotage, or even undertaking military operations. Every action against the Nazis, no matter how small, was an act to aid a side in the conflict that the whole world was involved in. Early resistance activity may have been courageous, but it was all the work of single people. Without any formal structure to the resistance, people were finding it hard to make a dent in the Nazis' strict regime. General Charles de Gaulle, who had fled to London when the Germans invaded, addressed the French people via BBC in late June of 1940. He urged them to fight back against the occupying Germans. Because there was still no formal command structure in the resistance, there was almost no unity between resistance groups. In September of 1941, resistance agents smuggled Jean Moulin to meet with de Gaulle and other exiled leaders. The British Special Operations Executive, the SOE, and the American Office of Strategic Services, the OSS, trained Moulin and gave him orders about what to do. He was then parachuted back into France to find the many small resistance groups and unite them into one large fighting force commanded and supplied by de Gaulle and the other leaders in London. This group that de Gaulle created was known as the FFI, or the Free French Forces. Once the resistance had the Allies backing it, many SOE and OSS agents were parachuted into France to instruct the resistance groups on weaponry, demolition, and military tactics. All kinds of people were united in the conflict against the hated Germans. There were just ordinary people, farmers, peasants, you know, housewives. SOE actually sought out women as a, as a, to, to help them. Um, and one of the reasons is, is that as a housewife, as a, a, a farmer, you were not as suspect as, as if you were, were a young man. The resistance was developed by the SOE and the OSS to provide the Allies with intelligence, to attack the Germans when possible, and to assist in the escape of Allied airmen. Intelligence gathering was vital to the Allies. The strength and placement of troops, the secrets of the V-1 bomb and the V-2 flying rocket, and the details of the defenses along the Atlantic coast in preparation for D-Day were all pieces of information that helped the Allies win the war that were collected by the Resistance. To help collect this information, most spies had many fake identities. 
Because of this, the size of the resistance always looked bigger than it really was. Escape lines for downed Allied airmen also played a major part in the conflict with the Germans. And this was extremely important because it took so much time and so much money to train an airman. And so in this way, um, uh, it was, you were saving money. And not only that, it was a great morale boost to the men who were shot down, knowing that they had a 50-50 chance of getting back to England. When Hitler broke his pact with Stalin, the leader of the Communist Soviet Union, on June 22, 1941, all of the Communists, who were already in France, immediately sprang into action. Among them were professional organizers, tacticians, saboteurs, and assassins. The Communists maintained that violence and conflict was the only way to demonstrate to the population that the Nazis were vulnerable and their defeat possible. These groups only took orders from the Communist Party leaders and had nothing to do with de Gaulle and the FFI. The Nazis' main weapon of power in occupied France was propaganda. If the Nazis could prompt the French to blame the French, or the British, or the Jews, or the Communists, anybody except the Germans, for the situation they were in, it would be more powerful than 50 troops armed with machine guns. The resistance, of course, had propaganda of their own. They tore down Nazi posters and put up posters of their own. They printed many underground newspapers that gave tips on how to hide from the Germans, and also included news that wasn't in the newspapers that the Nazis published. These newspapers were numerous and were usually the work of one or two people. The Marquise, the largest underground fighting organization, started out as groups of people who had fled to the mountains and forests, or wherever the terrain could hide them. Up until 1943, however, there were not many people, and they were concentrated more on surviving than fighting against the Nazis. But in 1943, the Germans announced that every man of around 25 years old was to be shipped off to Germany and work in a factory for two years. This prompted many young men to join the Marquis and escape the Germans. BBC and the underground newspapers urged young men to join the Marquis as well. The biggest problem posed to the leaders of the Marquis was how to get all the supplies they needed. They found the answer in nighttime raids against supply depots and other places where necessary supplies were held. In this way, they also picked up some weapons as well. The Marquis were essentially the largest fighting force out of the entire resistance. Another large part of the conflict between the resistance and the Nazis were the workers. Railroad workers were responsible for many acts of sabotage along the rails. In 1941, there were around 190 acts of sabotage along the railroads. In 1944, however, there were 4,940 acts of sabotage. Postal workers would open letters of importance to the Nazis and photograph them. They would also hide and deliver resistance mail. Doctors would also contribute. They would diagnose people in the resistance with horrible diseases so they wouldn't have to work. Also, since they had to write to get gas for their car, they could easily help deliver messages and even people for the resistance. During the occupation, there was conflict everywhere you turned in France. The members of the resistance were the people who took the conflict with the Germans into their own hands. They've been largely unheralded. People know very little about them. And I think it's important to, to focus on their bravery and the risk that they took. Without the resistance, the Allies might have failed on D-Day. Without the resistance, the Germans would have had a firmer hold on France. The story of the French resistance is full of conflict with the Germans. The members of the French resistance are the silent heroes of World War II.